This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, I just want to—I want to yeah. start by first um, thanking doc, Dr. Johnson for and, and for making this happen, um, for inviting me to be here uh, to be a part of this conversation. Um, it's, it's always an honor to sit down and build with Chuck D, who is someone who, uh, you know, I grew up listening to um, as a as a young man, as a teenager, and um, the music of Public Enemy um, greatly influenced my own sensibility as a young black man um, during the time period that, um, you know, hip hop was in many ways coming of age. And so, um, you know, the music of Public Enemy, the music of um, De La Soul, the music of Big Daddy Kane, the music, all of the, all of the artists that I've referenced in the early part of the film um, had a great influence on um, the work that you saw today. And you know, in many ways, and I'll just be very brief with this. In many, in many ways, um, a lot of my p political sensibilities were formed by the, the socially um, conscious, politically charged music that was created by Chuck D and so many other artists during that time period. And it was a time period where I felt like hip hop was the soundtrack to my generation's civil rights movement, right? And so when I began to see how hip hop was becoming derailed and a lot of those um, socially conscious, politically charged messages and themes were being watered down or completely shifted to being something completely different in the mainstream in popular culture, that's what led me to raise some real serious questions about what was going on in the music industry and what was going on um, in terms of the visual representation of black masculinity as well as black femininity. So all of those things kind of help shape and frame my thinking around making this documentary film. I look a lot different, don't I, from the film, don't I? <laughs> I know that's the subtext in the room. That's one, that's, one, that's one thing about when you put yourself in your own film, you get older, but you, you look the same in, in your film, right? So, um, it's an adjustment when people see you when you made a film that, that's about um, 12 years old. <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you very much for coming out and watching the film. Um, I, I have a question for you all. Did the film resonate with you at all? I mean, what did you think about the documentary? Yeah. I was telling Chuck behind uh, behind closed doors that it's just amazing. I was also saying, saying this to Gay, it's amazing that this film is still being shown, you know, uh, many years after I made the film. And I do remember, I recall sitting down in a room uh, when I was working on the proposal for this documentary and, and thinking to myself, if I really, really, really do a great job with this film, um, it, could, it could have a major impact and it could be around for a long time. I just didn't realize it would be around for this long. Um, so I'm really grateful and honored um, that I was inspired to, to create this documentary. Well, I knew it when you first asked me to do the interview, and it was a while before you actually caught up with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're both from Long Island. Um, I'm from Central Heights of Long Island. Chuck I'm D is from Roosevelt, From Long Roosevelt, Island. and he actually came after a couple of, uh, I guess, uh, well, this is, was kind of like in the beginning of email, the top of the century, yeah. back and forth, uh, publicists, me going on tour, him getting more of the film interviews together. And um, I had gotten an email that, that Byron reached out and says, well, I was an important aspect for a different point of artist view of, of what was going on at that particular time. And this was 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. And um, I have two older daughters, and 
they were in their teens, early teens. One was in single digits, and um, and they were subject to a lot of the things that were coming through the New York City hip hop stations, Hot 97, um, uh, the other station that yet to even emerge at that time. Power 105. Uh, Power and, their, and their beginnings, right, maybe. Right. And at that time, the major record labels felt that they didn't have to be accountable to anything else except for the business aspect of hip hop because the community had little to do with it, although they failed, although it was a, this, this, this across the board, united world of Benetton following hip hop, they felt that it was everybody's music, but they failed to recognize that 99% of the faces and voices still doing the music came from the community that they said no longer counted. Mm. And um, when Byron actually, uh, you know, looked to talk to me, I said, not only am I going to talk to him from an artist's point of view, but I'm going to talk to him from a, a father who's also raising two young women in the city of New York on the New York Tri-State area. And I'm gonna give you the straight up deal on, on, on what's, what, what the, the accountants or the lawyers or the business people tend to overlook just because it registers in their, in their, um, in their um, business coffers. So when I said, sure, Byron, when I could get around to it, man, sure. And then Byron came to my house in, in Roosevelt and, and I think I remember we had it downstairs in the yeah. basement where all my tapes yeah. and studios was at. And then I said, yeah, I'm going to just give you the real deal. I'm going to give you the unpopular side. Because yeah. when I first started in hip hop, I've been involved since 1979. My first records was 1987. <laughs> and you have to understand that hip hop is not built, it just didn't have this big boom effect of starting from nowhere. It came off of the creation of, of making something out of records and, and, and following through on the records of where they came from. So hip hop in the 80s came off of the aftermath of Gamble and Huff, which is Philadelphia International Records, and all their music was about message music mm -hmm. from the city of brotherly love. Just listen to what I said. The city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Philadelphia International was the Motown of the, of the 70s, like Motown was of the 60s. It was yeah. the United States black people's dominant record label. And Love is the Message was the, was the hip hop rhyme bed anthem that a lot of MCs started on. But just think of the title. Love is a Message, and the name of the group was MFSB. Now some people thought it was a curse thing going on, mm -hmm. but no, it really stood for mother, father, sister, brother. Mm -hmm. And this is what hip hop evolved out of that. So you had to inspire, not only just in the recording aspect of the respect that you had to have for the people, you had to give a full balance and also you had to be able to be watchable on stage because if you didn't present in a hip hop form on stage in a way that it would satisfy people that came check you out, you might get hurt. So it had to pay that respect to the community in all kinds of ways. And that was the first six to seven years of hip hop. And then my recording career started in 87. So it followed that, that line. By the time the 90s happened, when you had a, a, that radio station say, we're, we're the home of hip hop and R&B, that's when things started to change because somebody actually had the nerve to take it and redefine it. Mm -hmm. So that's when we hooked up in 2003. Yeah. Four years, five years after Eminem. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I and I remember going to your house uh, in Roosevelt, and I and I can't remember the exact time frame you gave me, but I think you said you had about twenty to twenty five minutes for an interview, yeah. and we ended up talking for I, it was probably close to an hour or over an hour, um, because the conversation just flowed, and uh, you know it eventually turned out that as you can see, you know Chuck D's presence in the film, um, you know ends up you know he ends up essentially being the, the voice of reason, you know, in the film, right? O almost like a, I don't want to use the word moral authority, but um, because I don't think that he's being overly moralistic, but, but you know, he's, you know, his, his voice has such credibility, not just because of who he is and what he represents, um, but the honesty and the integrity in which he analyzes and deconstructs you know, where hip hop was at that particular time, and in many ways, it still is. 
How many people are familiar with Public Enemy? Y'all, you all, you all you should be familiar, okay. All right. but, but the artists that you had in the film, they're actually parents of, of teenagers now. That's true. That, you know, that is true. And when I think it was, a, I think it was, a, was it the Clips? Was it the beginning the of the Clips, Clips yeah. career? And yeah. I told you, and I didn't know, yeah. I just was, you know, I was basically talking to Byron yeah. as, uh, as the artist in general. Yeah. Byron cut it in as if I, I was talking about the clips, but I was and I wasn't, but I was <laughs> saying that because I knew the deal. I knew all the artists. And I knew that they were pretty much, I'm not saying they were posers at that time, but their record companies only wanted them to sell by any means necessary. So if they had the pose and if they had the front and it fit a stereotype to keep their contract, they would do that. So that's why I said it's not even an artist's fault because they have managers and a company and when, they, when you address them with these issues and these stereotypes, it's so far beyond them. I said they can't even look you in the face because yeah. they don't even know. They D in the headlights. And here we are, fast forward, we're to, fast forward to Baltimore. Yeah. Take a city like Baltimore mm -hmm. who has been getting one-sided and you know, you hear the stations, they're, 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 they're called urban. What the hell is urban? Urban means you can have the music and the culture, but have no accountability to the people that, that it goes to or comes from. Mm -hmm. You take a city like Baltimore that's been getting urban radio blasted to them at all the corporate messages Stay and stereotypes stations, yeah. for the last 25 years, and you take the fast forward to now and wonder why young people in the city is angry and can't process that anger when they've been told that they're less than, they end this, end has become the, the, the one word national anthem for hip hop and, and for the last eight years where you see maybe a Catholic school girl, you know, in, in, in the fourth grade say in this, in that, in the schoolyard. It's like, and people just think these things just happen out of nowhere when they've been barraged by this for the last, so in for Baltimore, for, for, they're for decades, For decades. For decades. So, so, so for decades there have been these very limited and narrow prescribed roles and definitions of black and Latino masculinity that have been projected on airwaves, um, you know, um, in mainstream media, corporate media, I should say. Um, and I believe that these representations, these very narrow representations have a tremendous impact, not, on how, not only on how we view ourselves, but how other people view us, I, that's what I was saying. I think it's multifaceted. I don't think that hip hop is the blame for some of the police brutality that we see. I mean, police, police brutality and um, the oppression and repression of black men and black women um, precedes hip hop culture, right? I don't know if you all remember the, 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 uh, the, the Twitter hashtag by black, black Twitter that said, you know, hip hop, what was it, hip hop um, created slavery or something like that? It was, a, it was sort of like a, um, you know, a sarcastic take on people sort of blaming hip hop for police brutality and these police murders and all this. I don't, I don't go that far. I don't go as far as saying that hip hop is the reason for all these different things. We're talking about centuries of um, uh, oppression, you know, of, of black people, of black men that we see being played out in cities all over the country. Um, and I think that you know, many, many of these representations that we see and that we see in this film that continue today play a role in people criminalizing black boys and men, mm -hmm. uh, play a role in dehumanizing us. Um, you know, the, the myriad images that we see on television of black and Latino um, men as superhuman, who have these superhuman qualities, um, overly aggressive, very strong, hyper-masculine, hyper-violent, taps into and plays into all of the fears that have been invented for black men, um, that have been projected onto us. And there's no, there's, there's no, um, it, there's no, it's no wonder that black men are so feared, right? That the, that the, the knee-jerk response to black men and black masculinity is to shoot or to kill or wound. Now, I know this, it may sound like a side point because we're not talking about the film, but we're, we're talking about the ways in which media projects images of black 
and Latino boys and men and black and Latino girls and women in ways that are not positive and healthy, but are very destructive for us as a society. But it does fit in. Because if these stereotypes, they, 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 they loom larger mm -hmm. as time goes on, mm -hmm. and then you have a situation where somebody feels that, you know, this, this is all right for this particular artist to say because it makes them popular. Mm -hmm. What makes something popular in a society? It has to stick on to something. Yeah. It has to stick on to a movement, whether it's bad or whatever direction it might go on. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think we, what we talked in the back is that Fast forward, if a person's believing the stereotype or they say, you know what, I know about racial policies, and you ask them, like, okay, what's your proof? And they tell you that their friendship is based on electronics. Yeah. Like, my best friend I've never met, but he's my Facebook friend. They're black, so I, so I know something about black. Mm -hmm. I think the assumption has taken over as opposed to the, to the reality. Like, mm -hmm. you know what, I, I, I know and understand these people. Let's say if a riot took place or a rebellion took place in the 60s and an officer had to figure out, how do I deal in this community that I'm policing? Well, this is 2015. In Baltimore, there's nothing but new people. But it maybe the overstanding that we know these people is assumed more now because of people believing and being tied into the stereotype mm -hmm. as opposed to the real person. A 25-year-old police officer who just got his job three years ago maybe has this assumption of, yeah, I know black folk, mm -hmm. but you know black folk how? What's your proof? It's, mm -hmm. it's probably through electronic gadget. It's probably through some kind of, it's through electronics because how many people do you know personally? And then even if you do know people, how much of themselves do they believe in the stereotype, stereotypical image as opposed to the reality of just being themselves? Mm -hmm. So I just think, you know, it, it boils down to your, your movie explained like these, this imagery is seeded out of stereotypes mm -hmm. that are like projected in big business and commerce and culture for the sake of, you know, them saying, okay, look, we can have this with our, with our company. We can sell this. Yeah. We can't sell the good story. I mean, fast forward to 2015. Yeah. Whenever you see a face of color or a story of color, they, although they won't admit this, but you have the circles in, in corporate and media or, or things that just get the word out, they can't sell the good story, but they can sure enough spread the bad one. Yeah. And so fast forward 15, 12 years later, it's like we're attached to a lot of the bad stories and the stereotypes have grown with steroids. Yeah. So it's really steroid-o-types mm. because the stories are like, oh, wow, it's, I get nothing but this type of story mm. out of this figure. So I think the, the film is way more re relative. Really, we're, experience, we're really experiencing beyond, beyond beats and rhymes. Because mm. like I said, you got a young demographic out there. If they want to challenge the stereotype, is that the popular notion that will keep them popular. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, it, it's become commonplace. And now we see a situation like Baltimore and everything's about analysis on CNN and MSNBC, like it ain't nothing else going on. And, and the big discussion should be, how do we prevent the next Freddie Gates? Yeah. And then what's the scenario surrounding Freddie Gates' environment? You know, and what's in there, and how is Freddie, how, you, do we become heroes when we're dead? Mm -hmm. And then the, the fear of the, of the FOP 12 years later, the fraternity order of the police, are they nervous about these stereotypes? So those are the good questions I threw out there as well, man, because I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's one of the most revealing films connected into the genre of all times. And I'm very, Thank you very, much. very happy that, that you made it because not only I'm thankful for being in it because I didn't have to be in it unless you wanted me to, but I'm saying, <laughs> even if I wasn't, this is something I've I paraded, my wife has paraded it, we've paraded, said this is the statement. You don't need mm -hmm. to go anywhere else. This is the statement that actually diagnosed the seed when it was actually, you know, mid-sprouting. Yeah. 
So if anybody comes up and say, I don't know what you're, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. The media, hip hop doesn't cause this. I said, study this film and come back and write me a damn report. Mm. You know? Well, that's a major compliment coming from, from you. You know, I, I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I, when I, when I made this film, you know, one of the things that I, I, um, I said to myself and everybody around me was that I wanted, I didn't want to make a film that was uh, like a cultural translator. I didn't want to be a cultural translator. I wanted to make a film that was going to be honest for me and my friends who knew what real hip hop was, right? And who knew the story of hip hop and knew how, um, you know, hip hop had become derailed. And so I wanted to tell that story use my authentic voice um, and ask the questions that I always wanted to know. I wanted to make the film that I wanted to see. So, you know, I'm just very grateful and glad that, uh, you know, I was able to do that. So from a social movement's perspective and for thinking about a room that's filled with many excited, engaged students and community members, um, advice, suggestions, you know, for people on the day-to-day -day of what to do, um, because it seems like, well, it's a long haul, but I really want to, you know, hear from you about concrete ideas and suggestions for what people should be doing when they leave this room, no matter the spaces they're going to, mm -hmm. as well as keeping that motivation and inspiration. Um, because, right, you can look at things and say, wow, like, there's been change, but mm -hmm. why, why do we still have <laughs> Ferguson? Why do we still have Baltimore? Why do we still have, you know, situations on this campus, right? Um, so that's my thoughts and questions for you. Both. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll try and answer as much as I can to the best of my ability. Um, the one thing I'll say is I have a real difficult time sort of telling people what to do, and especially telling young people what to do, because I think young people um, should take agency, should have agency in terms of their own activism, right? Um, I think that you all have a different perspective than I do. Um, and so I think that you all know um, what's best in terms of what needs to happen among your generation. Um, I can tell you what I did. You know, for me, the big thing that I always try and say is that if there's something that you are unhappy with or dissatisfied with in terms of um, social justice issues that may impact you or you may be affected by, the worst thing that you can do is remain silent. Yeah. The worst thing that you could do is do nothing. And so for me, you, when I realized that there were changes that were taking place in hip hop, and I developed a language to better understand what those changes were and why they were happening, I used my skill set to make this film, right? And, and at the time that I made this film, at the time that I met Chuck and interviewed him, I had no idea that I would be here 12 years, almost 15 years later, talking to audiences about this. I had no idea the film was going to be used as an educational tool at hundreds and hundreds of colleges around the country and in high schools and in community groups. I had no idea there was going to be a curriculum attached to it. I had no idea that people were going to be, you know, transformed by the film in the way that they were. If I did not believe in myself and if I didn't have the confidence in myself to believe that my voice mattered, that my authentic voice mattered, then, you know, I would not have made this film, you know? And so I think it's really important to honor yourself. You don't have to be a filmmaker, right? You can use whatever gifts that you have, the intelligence that you have, the tools that you have at your disposal, and you have far more tools at your disposal mm. than I did and that Chuck did, you know, when he was, you know, um, growing up. So you have the access, you have the tools, all you have to do is have the confidence and the belief in yourself and create these sort of communities where you're actually taking action and you're doing something as opposed to being silent. I would like to congratulate you for your work on hip hop. Thank you. Um, pardon my English. Talking about me or Chuck, but, but you both, you, yeah. 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 Pardon my English. I'm from a French-speaking country in Europe. Uh, I would like to react on the title, "Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhyme." 
Um, I'd like to know if you would do some um, uh, work also on the different uh, facets of hip hop, like graffiti or mm. breakdance. And I would like to mention uh, that hip hop is also international culture in France or Switzerland. It's already a 30 year old uh, culture that I grew up with personally. And over there, the major artists uh, mainly talk about political issues, speak about family, uh, religion, issues such as immigration, but the major artists over there honestly don't speak about racism, or about, I mean, are not racist against each other, or don't speak about uh, talking bad things about women, pardon my English again. Mm, it's okay. But it's really, I think, a different uh, aspect of hip hop that is maybe interesting to study from an international point of view, and I would like just to mention it and see you if you have a point of view on this. Uh, you know, that's a really good point and really good question that, that you asked about the international um, appeal and you know the, the, um, the level of participation, right? And how hip hop is politicized in other countries in ways that it may not be as politicized um, as it used to be here in this country. Um, you know, I decided to make a film that focused on one particular thing, you know, and, and there were questions about whether or not I should broaden the scope of this film out, um, you know, to, to, because hip hop was such a global phenomenon at that time. Um, you know, but I decided to keep it, you know, local and very specific to the issues that I, that I cared about most and, mo and most deeply um, because I, I wanted to make a film that was very um, defined, right? That had a very defined structure and then that did not try to tackle too much. Um, you know, and so, and so that, that was just like an editorial choice that I made as a documentary filmmaker. And you know, I named the film Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes because, you know, at that particular time, I heard so many people say, well, you know, I don't really listen to the lyrics. I just listen to the beats, right? And you hear this all the time. That's why you, why you're laughing. You know, I, I just, I just dance. I mean, it's just music I dance to. I don't, I don't really pay attention to the lyrics. I just dance to the beats. And so, you know, I made, I created the title so that we could begin to think beyond the beats and beyond the rhymes and look at what's going on culturally um, with this music and this art form that has so much influence and has so much impact in ways that we don't necessarily think about. But I do want to mention that I tried to interview several white male hip hop executives and they all declined my, my request for interviews. That's the one thing I regret about this film is I didn't include that tidbit of information in, in the documentary. Um, but Leah Cohen, I tried to interview Leah Cohen. Um, I tried to interview... Um, they ran from you like the plague. And I mean, no, Leah Cohen literally ran from me. Yeah. No, he literally <laughs> ran from the camera. I couldn't even use the footage uh -huh. of him running because it, it really didn't read, but he, was, he ran from the camera as I was asking the questions. So... Um, but, but, that, but this is very important. This, yeah. this leads up to where it is now. You can have any movement, any rally, any protest, but if you can't I expose and identify who's pushing the button, on the decision but, to but, turn the masses into the masses, then, then... And see, and that's, that, and that's why, that's, that's when it becomes more important to focus on the looters, right, who are looting the stores, as opposed to systemic racism within the uh, criminal justice system. You see what I'm saying? You know, if you can, if you can keep, if you can keep the, the, the masses of people focused on the easiest targets, mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. the the people who are the most vulnerable, the easy, uh, the easiest to exploit, then that takes all of the the pressure. That um, uh, you absolve any responsibility from the power structure, and I think that's what happens a lot. When we have conversations about rap music and hip hop culture, that's what happens when we have conversations about um, police violence or the criminalization of black men, black boys, even black girls and black women women of color, who, however you want to define it, you know, we, we always tend to focus on the victims of the brutality as opposed to the people who are in control, who have the most power, and who, who actually control the very communities that, you know, um, that we have this microscope on. So, I mean, I think that that's, that's real. 
And I think that's real talk, you know, and I think that, you know, when, when, we, when we have these conversations, you know, I always, especially when we talk about my film, um, you know, I, I, I always try to contextualize rap music and hip hop culture within the larger context of American culture, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't have a real honest conversation about hyperviolence and, and, and hip hop without having a conversation about hyperviolence in American culture. Mm -hmm. You can't have a conversation about misogyny and sexism in rap music and hip hop culture without having a conversation about sexism and misogyny in the larger American culture. You can't talk about homophobia. You can't talk about capitalism or hypercapitalism without talking about the capitalism of this country that so many of these young men, these young boys and men who come out of um, communities where there's intense levels of, of poverty, um, who, who are not going to desire to have all of the material wealth and, and, um, and, and access to uh, money and other things that they, that they strongly desire. So you, you have to be able to put all these things into a much larger context. Otherwise, you're just doing um, the job of scapegoating, which mm -hmm. in my opinion is very problematic. Uh, Mr. Hurt, um, I had the pleasure of volunteering with Men Stopping Violence in Atlanta before yes. I moved to California. And our motto was, we are the work. Okay. It's all about mm -hmm. holding men accountable. Do you feel that since the time this film was made, do you feel that hip hop has finally embraced accountability for men's violence towards women? Mm -mm. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, if, if, I think if anything, I, I think that hip hop has become more hypersexualized than it did before I made this film. Um, I, I don't think that there's a tremendous amount of accountability. I don't think there are people within the industry who hold uh, each other accountable. Um, I think that I, I believe that. Based on what I hear, um, I, I believe that women, um, for the most part, play the role of, uh, you know, sexual kitten, um, the object of sexual desire and service to men, you know, within hip hop and you know outside of hip hop. So no, I don't. I don't really think that um, hip hop has taken much accountability for the level of uh, sexism and exploitation for girls and women you know, in hip hop, any more so than um, any industry outside of hip hop has taken much accountability. So no, that would be my answer. Hi, um, so I'm just gonna go into my question. So okay. thinking about rap today with like artists such as Kendrick and his album To Pimp a Butterfly and J. Cole and his um, new album that just came out and thinking, I'm not sure if you all watch music videos today, um, <laughs> Wet Dreams and that music video is like, there's in no way, there's two dogs and it's a song about two people having sex for the first time in um, school, but it's just two dogs and that's like the image that's portrayed, no like images of women and sex and all of that besides these yeah. two dogs. And then like GMO, G-O-M-D, um, and that video of like a slave revolt that's happening. And then even in Drake, like Drake is like an emotional rapper and he, like he kind of moves away from that hardcore, like, yeah. you know, like I'm not trying to diss him, but <laughs> you know, like that hardcore, like yeah, yeah. shooting violence and yeah. all that. He really brings back emotions and like loving and like really kind of soft rap. So like with kind of thinking about where rap is coming and like going in, those are kind of like artists that I feel like are bringing, like kind of more prominent in today. What are your like feelings and thoughts about like those artists in like kind of like, in a sense, the activism that is coming through Kendrick and J. Cole, even though there are problematic issues that I do find with J. Cole's album. Mm -hmm. But um, like, you know, like what is kind of like your opinions and thoughts about that? I think that J. Cole and um, Kendrick Lamar are very talented, brilliant artists. Um, I think that they just, just like um, there were artists in previous generations who dealt with social political content I think that they are sort of like the um, uh, the exceptions to the rule, you know, um, in, in terms of popular culture today. Um, and I think that they they serve a very important purpose and function, you know, in, in rap music, hip hop culture. I'm familiar with the song that you're talking about. I didn't I haven't seen the video, um, but I think that I mean I think they offer something that a lot of people who love hip hop. Uh, are looking for. You know, I think that, you know, Kendrick Lamar offers a, a, a real breath of fresh air. 
um, from, you know, what people have been exposed to, you know, um, endlessly, you know, um, for the last several years. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, I approve of them. I like them. I mean, I was listening to Kendrick Lamar and, and you know, all the way from, uh, from the East Coast and on the way um, here today, you know. In fact, it was so funny. It was, I walked into a bathroom and I heard there was this young dude. Who was much, he seemed like he was much younger than me. I don't know how old he was, but he was bumping Biggie and I was bumping Kendrick Lamar, which was just like real interesting. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate um, the social commentary that Kendrick Lamar brings to the table. Uh, but, you know, there, there are always those exceptional individuals um, that stand at the top of the game. But then there's also, you know, the vast majority of artists that are out there that project some of the same images and representations, but in different ways, you know? It may not be as over the top in terms of the violence. I, I, think, I think it's a lot more, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me it seems like, you know, hip hop is a lot more hypersexualized than anything else now. Am I right? Am I wrong about that? Am I right? Am I wrong? Yeah. 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 Mm. It's almost like soft porn. Like, is, is it, am I right? <laughs> or maybe even porn. Yeah. It's like you're listening to porn music. Yeah, I, I, I sometimes, you know, I tell <laughs> artists all the time, and there's thousands of them we have at Rap Station, you know, a lot of independence, global, classic, a lot of women doing art. And the biggest challenge is like, can you really seriously do you really believe what you spit? Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you, what's your core belief into what you spit? Now, if it's 50% that you believe mm -hmm. and the other 50% that you kind of like making up with the crowd, I tell them just try to, you know, try to balance yourself to where it's closer to your core belief mm -hmm. as a person, as opposed to the situation that gave you the contract. Mm -hmm. Because you gotta know who you, who you rhyme into. And if you rhyme into, can you actually man a woman up to that situation of being truthful with what you wrote and what you spit? What you do? What are you doing it for? Mm. Are you doing it for the ride, or are you doing it for actually for for the art's reason? Art is art, so um, that's one of the biggest things I try to get across to people. Um, do what you really seriously say, what you really seriously believe, and try not to front. Can I just say this real quick? I know you have a question, but you know, I. I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to take anything away from Kendrick Lamar because I do think that, um, you know, he, he, he carved out his own space and I think he created something that was like un unapologetically black, it's political, you know, uh, you know, he's making his own social commentary. I mean, I think it's dope. But I, 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 I still don't believe that even the best of like socially conscious hip hop today is on par with the level and the intensity of the social commentary and the political commentary of like the public enemy. And I don't, I, I, I would like, I would bet my life on that. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the group that probably comes closest to the public enemy, you know, that I could think of that comes closest would be like a dead prez, you know? I, mean, I don't know if people are familiar with dead prez. You know, but I, I think that, you know, they're one, you know, they're, 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 there's only a handful of groups that even come close to the, the level of um, hard charging political commentary that Public Enemy offered. So you should go back and you should, if, you, if you're not familiar with Public Enemy, wow. go look them up. You all said that you were, but go back and revisit that music. Even when I go back and I listen to Public Enemy, I'm like, damn. Even when I listen to like Big, like when I, I listen to Big Daddy Kane, yeah. Like Big Daddy, Big Daddy Kane had a lot of like because you couldn't you couldn't lie you couldn't lie to New York number mm -hmm. one you could yeah. not lie to New York yeah. you could not lie you could not come off like what you wasn't because in New York everything's so close you get checked on that mm. if you talk in this jail if you talk in hardcore prison mm -hmm. then there's so many cats that's in and out of there they're yeah. gonna check you on right, that I see. but when I things see. became spaced out you could kind of like pose and I think that's one of the biggest challenges to J Cole and Kendrick it's like. You have to convince your biggest listener that you're more true to what you do than they are. Mm. And I say anybody can have any audience, but you got to convince your biggest fan who believes everything in you that you believe everything in yourself than they believe in you. And that's the biggest challenge that every artist has to, you know, has to, you know, overcome. 
And if they're true to that, then they could get 20 and 30 years out of it if they're consistent. Mm. But this doesn't come out of just out, out of the art form. This comes out, I mean, Kwame Tori, and I'll end on this note, told me years ago, is that you got to provide as an artist a consistent, especially if you're writing your mm. own stuff, mm. you have to provide a consistency because people come and they come and, and they go yeah. and they change their beliefs. Mm. But you provide a consistency as an artist. And, um, you know, and that makes you further any kind of storm because mm. people, they, they plug into your belief as some sort of energy. So that's important. And I think J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar and so many others, they have bright lights. I would like to see them being encouraged by their whole business atmosphere around them to say, yeah, do your thing. We know that this sold less than the last one, but was no pressure on you. As opposed like you went conscious on this, mm -hmm. the last time you spit about cutting off heads and throwing chicks down staircases, we want that. But now you went conscious, we, you, you know, we dipped off, so we're gonna cut you out of here in a minute. Mm. And I think those, those are what artists have been grappling with the last 25 years without y'all knowing what's been going on behind the scenes in hip hop, mm. which was the midpoint of, of when you made the film. Mm. They had to grapple with that pressure of like, man, I was able to get me Back then, they was able to get a, what was the car of the choice? I got me a fat Lexus in 2002, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I got out of my contract, now I'm broke again. They really dangled a lot of those artists mm -hmm. and say, yo, you better pick the, we don't live there, you better pick the stereotype that's gonna keep your contract. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that, that has had effects, so. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of not lying in New York, Brooklyn in the house. All right. And um, a, a video of a young girl getting jumped at a McDonald's in Brooklyn went viral a couple yes. of weeks ago. And that is in my neighborhood. So my question is, let's go beyond mainstream hip hop, right? When we're thinking about sites of black cultural production that aren't in the mainstream. So I'm, so I'm thinking specifically of things like Queen of the Ring, where it's like battle rap, and these women are spitting these lyrics about jumping one another. So in this example of this young woman, Anaya Ferguson, who was the ringleader of this jumping, what do you two think with your experience in hip hop and how battle rap was often blamed for sending young black men to prison. Now young black women are being sent to prison. And this young woman, like most black women who are going to prison, have kids. So she's going to lose her child. Her child's gonna grow up in this foster system. So I was just wondering, from your experiences in the yeah. male perspective, what can we do for these young women who are part of the hip hop game, who are part of this hyper, aggressive violence type of rapping from what you all learned from the male perspective what can we say to these sisters who are spitting the truth and they will jump you they will do what they say in their rhymes so that's my question i'll be real short about this it depends on who's teaching what just because you learn something you got to learn something and you got to be able to be bold enough to teach it what, what's right and wrong and, and what the definition, whatever, what something is. People who talk about battle rap, they don't even know what the roots of battle rap were. The battle was in the beginning of hip hop in the 80s and the early, in late 70s and the early 80s, had the, they won from an intellectual standpoint. Vocabulary was your artillery. Mm -hmm. If you had no words, how you gonna rhyme, right? It went into more like, it, it morphed into the dozens, then it morphed into like super dozens, so I'm dissing you and I'll knock you out. It, it went into some other area, which uh, Byron could pick up on, but the rules of what battling had changed along the course of time, and then you gotta start asking questions like, who changed it? When a lot of people come up and tell me what their definitions are, or to give me their reasons for what hip hop is, this is what's spitting, oh yo, this is what they doing now, and all that. I'm like, my question, I never get an answer on. Who told you that? <laughs> no one seems to answer that. How you come up with that one? Well, I, it, cause I'm waiting for them to tell me where they saw it. I said, so that taught you? So the definitions of hip hop or whatever, People can't just think that these things just popped up out of nowhere. It had to come from somewhere, and if it actually morphed into a, a, a situation, you got to be able to define what it is and what it ain't. That ain't battle rap. That's just cats that's, that's screaming at each other ready to fight. 
If you want to go into like Ronda Rousey situation, then you're doing mixed martial arts. Then you're doing something in a ring. No, I don't want to do that. But I want to, but I want to out battle rhyme somebody. But you're not using words. You didn't use a curse word 80 times in the same word. You're not really spitting. So they got to be told that, nah, you're not rhyming. You're not rapping. You're not battling. You're just making up your, you freestyling your own existence. That ain't going to work here. And oh, oh, you want to fight? Then let's get you in a ring and let you go mix martial arts on somebody who's going to really seriously give you. No, I don't want to do that either. So what you, what you, what you making up your own fun? Byron actually tell you exactly, you know, from, from what I told you, like, they're not battle rapping. They battle rapping in their own minds, but it's not really nowhere close to anything that is relevant to anything other than this is what we made up in our own world. We freestyle and at each other, but we're not really spitting better. We, we not fighting. We somewhere in the middle. That ends up not going anywhere except for being its own hype and it dissolves not too far after that. I know it's a reality. But the reality, sometimes it leads in the, the misunderstanding turning into a further misunderstanding of a young woman being brutalized and now with somebody, with four or five people throwing cameras on there. Look, how many of y'all had a smartphone eight years ago? Nobody. So all of a sudden, new apparatus, new gadgets come into foreplay and then into the situation and everything becomes some twisted, morphed out rule after that. So things, expect weird things to pop up out of all these gadgets that people have, these new things that they take on, these new redefinitions of what they think this is instead of the, the proper definition. And um, it's, a, it's a side effect that gets, that gets cleared with better teaching about what it is and what it ain't, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's well said. I, I would just add on to that, I think, Culturally, I think that we, we have all become far too desensitized to violence, right? I mean, we've all, you know, become sort of, um, you know, we've all developed like this um, thirst for violence. I mean, how many people are gonna watch, you know, Mayweather Pacquiao on Saturday night? I'm sure many people in this room will probably watch that, that fight that has been sold and packaged, you know, to us, um, you know, in amazing ways. But I think, I mean, I think in an, in an industry where um, brown girls and women are trying to carve out their space within this very hyper-masculine art form. I think, you know, unfortunately, it seems to me that many of um, the female participants in hip-hop have taken on many of the characteristics of some of the more hyper-masculine, hyper-violent aspects of the culture. You know, I mean, that's just my, my take on it. And I think that combined with the desensitization of violence, in addition to the emergence of hip hop sites like World Star Hip Hop, you know, where people can go to have that appetite fed, you know, of this like senseless kind of over the top violence that, that's like easily accessible and readily accessible, I think makes it, you know, um, I think it, it's just sort of, uh, uh, it just it just makes it more again it just makes it more hyper it just creates a more hyper violent society that we're living in you know and and it's a society where you know people there's there's no accountability and people are not really being challenged and checked about it and so we just see more of it yeah. so I think I mean you know so my my response to it you know from a human perspective is that. I think is deeply problematic, whether it's male or female, mm. right? Whether it's black, white, Asian, Latino, to see um, people sort of watch young teenage, um, you know, individuals fight as sport where people don't sort of inter intervene and do something about it. It just perpetuates cycles of violence that I think are very problematic. I hope that all of you will join me in thanking this extremely meaningful conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both so much for coming. Yeah, Thank you.